Welcome back! In this video I'm going to work on one of the past videos where I introduced non-equilibrium and chemical transformations and more in general the Crookes and Jarzinski theorem. By, because in that previous videos I didn't give actually a true application how do I then actually use these chemical non-equilibrium transformations in order to get something out of it. Now I'm going to show you some examples on the calculation of the binding free energy of a protein ligand system because that's actually what I work on nowadays so it's a thing where I have more experience on. I'm sure that these methods can be used in different scenarios too but I'm not going to talk about them in this video. In any case if you want some refresh to refresh something about non-equilibrium chemical transformations or Crookes and Jarzinski theorem I will leave the links in the description. In the end, what I'm going to introduce in this video will be, uh, and I will, of course it, it will take some time to arrive there, but I want to introduce the fast switching double annihilation method, also called FSTAM, and the virtual double system single box method. That I said for calculating the binding free energy of a protein ligand system. And actually, the virtual double system single box is a method that touches me more near, but nearly because actually my master thesis project has been to automate the pre-processing uh, that ne is needed to do on uh, PDB files, that are the files in which you keep protein uh, coordinates, in order to make these calculations for virtual double system single box on uh, the Gromax molecular dynamics program. In theory, uh, until a certain point, it's also implemented for a lesser known molecular dynamic program called ORAC, but um, in the end, we more or less left it there. Uh, the important part is Gromax, mostly because uh, Gromax is accelerated uh, on GPUs and it's much more uh, well known than ORAC. I will leave you the GitHub link in the description. Of course, you will notice that this has been my first Python uh, project because it's it's not written as well as I would like it to be written, and some things will need to be refactored or rewritten. But uh, yeah, I didn't have time to do it now, so for now you will have to see, let's say, a naive implementation of it. But in the end, it works. It does what it has to do. You start with a PDB with inside a protein and a ligand and you will get the various inputs that you need to run on an HPC cluster in order to do this virtual double system single box. Now, let's start from the beginning. As you remember, the alchemical transformations in general are transformations where we decouple and therefore annihilate a part of the system or we recouple it so we created um, a part of the system inside the broader system. To make an example, we could annihilate a ligand inside a protein pocket. We could create a ligand inside a water box and things like that. And we talked about how uh, non-equilibrium chemical transformations have the big advantage of being, uh, of not needing to care too much about what's happened happening in the middle of the chemical transformation. You don't need to create some equilibrium steps like in the equilibrium of chemical transformations. So that's uh, some less worries, less things to think about. But the problem with them is that you usually get a higher confidence interval, more error. Because if you use Jadzinski, and I'm going to take for granted that we're going to use the Jadzinski theorem all this time, because even though Crookes theorem on paper gives you better results, it's quite often pretty, pretty difficult to actually implement in the true program and to actually do it. So I'm going to talk about Jadzinski, but as you might remember, Jadzinski is an exponential average. This means that you can get a big bias, big errors, uh, and that's a problem. So you cannot like do three, four or five alchemical transformations on your system and make an, an average and a standard deviation and a confidence interval out of them. You need to do things uh, a little bit differently. 
In fact, what you do usually is starting from a cer certain number of starting configurations, you run hundreds of fast non-equilibrium alchemical transformations. In this way, by having hundreds of them, you will get better results and you, you should be able to uh, have less bias due to Jasinski. Of course, there can always be some problematic system and in that cases you might want to do more runs or use a different method. But for not too poorly behaving systems, that's, this works pretty well. So, and how do we take the starting configurations? Well, in theory, you can take them any, how, in any way you want them. You could simply start, take one configuration and r run uh, some hundreds of alchemical transformations starting all from the same configuration. Yeah, you would get a good free energy estimate of that process when the, for example, the ligand inside the protein pocket is exactly in that position. But as you know, uh, nothing is stationary in, na in nature. And so at normal temperature, uh, 25 degrees or whatever. So if you're not at zero Kelvin, you will have things moving. Your ligand will have more positions and more configurations and conformation that it will have inside your protein pocket. It might have some torsions going on that change its geometry in a quite important way, etc., etc., etc. So, how do we get uh, a series of starting configurations that represent the Boltzmann distribution? of your ligand at a certain temperature inside a certain system. So for example, inside the protein pocket or in vacuum. One method that is the one that is quite often used is a Hamiltonian replica exchange. Because with the Hamiltonian replica exchange, I will leave a link in for the video where I talk about better how a Hamiltonian replica exchange works. Um, you get the Boltzmann distribution of a system even if there are some high energy barriers. So you're able to, in a short molecular dynamic run, or relatively short, you can explore the whole conformational phase space. Usually the part of the Hamiltonian that is scaled in between the various replicas is the torsional part because it's the part that you're more interested in. Of course, you could also scale angles, vibrations, you're free, but usually the interesting part is the torsional. You simply scale the torsional part of the Hamiltonian on the ligand and on the surrounding binding pocket of the protein. This way you can use a smaller number of replicas, for example, eight, and you will still get to explore properly the phase space and have a good acceptance or swap acceptance ratio. You usually want something that is between 10 and 50%, but maybe the, the, there isn't a true consensus, but I guess 30% is a number that many people like very much. In the end, what you're doing is more or less um, a Metropolis Monte Carlo. Uh, yeah, there isn't a true consensus. Some people say that the right way to explore a a space in um, is to have 50% acceptance, some 30% acceptance, but in the end, the important thing is that in the end, the, the results are good enough. So if we have uh, our protein with our pocket and our ligand, we can do the Hamiltonian replica exchange in order to get our Boltzmann distribution. So a series of starting configurations where our ligand might be a bit more like this, a bit more like that, some position, some rotations, torsions, and then you get all these um, configurations that mimic the Boltzmann distribution of that system. And then you make an alchemical transformation from starting from all these configurations. 
and then you calculate the free energy out of the result of all these calculations. In this way, you will actually get the free energy that you have in nature, the one that you expect, the one that experimentally, if you have your protein and your ligand inside a lab, you will measure that, this one because, of course, in the lab, the, the ligand is free to explore the whole, his whole conformational space. What you get is a time and space average of this free energy. And this is a, the way to get uh, computationally a similar result to what you will get experimentally. Now, this approach is called often fast switching double annihilation method. The interesting part is that all these alchemical transformations don't need to interact one with, with one another. This makes this algorithm very, very parallel and therefore it can scale linearly with your computational resources. Then, of course, if we simply decouple our ligand from the protein, we will get the free energy due to protein ligand solvated that become a solvated protein plus a ligand that is the perfect gas phase. And we will simply get the free energy of this process. But that's not what we are interested in. What we really want is to get the free energy of a process where we have our solvated protein ligand that become a solvated protein plus a solvated ligand. And that's what you actually get experimentally. Because uh, of course it, in a lab or in your cells or wherever, the ligand isn't going to magically become a pure gas. Uh, it will have to be solvated. Therefore, on another side, you will have to create your ligand inside a box of water. Or more in general, you will have to solvate your ligand in order to get the second part where you solvate your ligand in order to get the full thermodynamic cycle. But now, um, how do we actually implement it? There are different methods. For example, there is the double system single box method, where you have a big box of water, you have your protein with the ligand inside, and then you have a decoupled ligand inside the same box of water. Of course, you have to put a restraint in order to avoid that the decoupled ligand, that therefore is in gas phase, uh, doesn't go too near to the protein because it has to feel bulk water, not the proximity of the protein. So it would look something like this. We have our a very big box of water, so water everywhere. We have a decoupled ligand that is in gas phase and therefore doesn't interact with the rest of the system. We have our nice protein with its pocket, and we have a ligand that is solvated, solvated and interacting with the protein. What we do is that in the same moment, in the same time, you will annihilate this ligand and create and create this ligand here. In this way, in one only one run, you will get the equivalent exactly what we wanted. You you will have get from this situation where you have a solvated protein ligand system to a situation where you have a solvated protein and a solvated ligand, and the solvated ligand is in bulk water, because in fact you will have to put a restraint in order to avoid this ligand to go too near to the protein because we want the ligand to be solvated in bulk water, to be alone, not, not to feel the protein anymore. Now, this, is, this method has the advantage of being conceptually easy, 
um, in the end, the work that you will get from this alchemical transformation will be already the right work that you wanted. You, you will calculate a dissociation free energy that is then simply the binding free energy with the sign changes. And, uh, and yeah, you don't need any extra stuff. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, there are some. One of them is that you have to put this restraint that will make behave this ligand in a not too natural way because it will actually not will have to, to, to go around the protein. It, in the end, that's not a true, not, not really natural thing to do. And that's not only the only restraint you need to do because you will always need to put a position restraint of this ligand in order not to say too far away from the protein. So a center of mass, center of mass restraint in order to avoid that when it's almost decoupled that it starts in going who knows where. So you had two different restraints that are pretty a problem because it's not always too easy to make the free energy correction for restraints. For the center of mass, center of mass restraint, yes, it's not complicated, but for these other restraints, things get more complex. And then as you may, you may have it imagine it, in this situation, you have a huge box of water. This means that you will need a lot of computational resources in order to make this calculation happen. So how could we make things uh, less complex on uh, actual implementation level and have less water in order to consume less computational resources and actually less time? No, you could do things in two separated boxes. So double system, double box. In this way, you won't need to put any kind of restraint in order to avoid this ligand to interact with the protein because there are diff two different MD runs in two different systems. And you have less water because you won't need to make this huge box. In the end, a ligand doesn't need a too big of a box. And uh, the protein, yes, okay, it needs a big box, but not as big as before. So you are already um, losing less computational resources. So you will do, in this case, the annihilation. In this case, you can actually choose if you want to make do the Hamiltonian replica exchange of the ligand inside water that interacts with water and then annihilate it, or make the Hamiltonian replica exchange of the ligand in vacuum and then create it. It, it depends. Making a Hamiltonian replica exchange in vacuum is quicker, but you might be interested in knowing how the ligand in, behaves in water in general. So, yeah, it's something you have to think about. And then you will get two different free energies. The free energy of this system, of this uh, part, and the free energy of this part. And then you sum them together with the right sign, depending on what you did here. And again, you will get the dissociation free energy or the binding free energy. The difference is only a sign. And this is already computationally much more, much better than the previous system. But still, there is still one problem. Because of the fact that Jasinski tends to be very biased, you will still get, uh, have the risk to get very bad results. So how can we make results better? So, and the only way, if you do the two separated, the two separated free energies, the only way you have to get better results, if you see that you're biased due to the fact that Jasinski tends to be biased when you don't have a very big set of uh, data, is to make more runs, more runs, more runs, a huge number of them. And so, uh, and this is also a problem of the previous method, the single box double system. So yeah, again, uh, it's not so interesting. You still risk to get some bad results uh, if you don't do an insane amount of runs. Because in the end, how many runs can you do? 
you can do 200 of these ones and 400 of these ones because that's faster, there are less atoms and it's still not that much but yeah, with Gromax for example it takes depending on how big the protein is some few hours, I don't know, one hour, two hours to do one sim, one run. So yeah, if, uh, when, if you use one GPU for a run and um, yeah, okay, you can make a nice job array, you can run many of them together, but in the end, you cannot do 2000 of them. That's too much. So here comes in the idea of the virtual double system single box. In the end, it's actually this thing here, but simply with a different post-processing and with a one string attach, attached to make the virtual double system single box, you need to create the ligand inside the box of water. You cannot annihilate it. There is a mathematical reason, but this video would become too long and pretty boring. In the end, you need to create the ligand in the box of water. You cannot do otherwise. So you will have to do the Hamiltonian replica exchange of the ligand in vacuum and then create it in water. On this side, nothing changes. You make the Hamiltonian replica exchange of the ligand in the pocket and then annihilate it. But now, what you do, instead of calculating the two distinct free energies is something more peculiar. In fact, as the two runs are completely uncorrelated, instead of calculating the work separately and then of course using Jadzinski in order to get a free energy out of it, you sum the work values of these two separated processes and only then you use Jasinski. So you will directly get the full free energy like you did in the double system single box. But here is the, here is the catch, here is the trick, the interesting thing. These two processes, the protein ligands and the ligand alone, are completely uncorrelated. They, they never touch each other. There is no, no binding between the work you get from creating the ligand in the box of water and annihilating the ligand in the protein. So, um, how do I sum them? Do I sum one with one, two with two? No, there is no reason. And actually one and two are simply arbitrary numbers to use to count how many runs you have done. No, as there is no reason to sum, uh, that there is no couples to sum together, you will sum each value which each other value. So each value of the annihilation, sum it with, for, with separately with each value of the creation of the ligand. In this way, if you had 10, did 10 runs of the annihilation of the ligand inside the protein and 10 runs of the creation of the ligand inside the box of water, you will get 10 times 10 work values. So 100 work values. And then you will do Jarzinski on these 100 different work values that represent 100 different ways in which this ligand could go through this whole thermodynamic cycle. But instead, oh, uh, but you only did 20 runs. 10 on the protein side and 10 on the ligand side. This way you're getting more with less. And that's the whole idea behind it. In the end, you are doing what you did in the double system single box. So directly getting the free energy without dividing it into two different parts. But you don't get the problems of the double system single box. You don't get the big box. Don't get the fact that if you do 100 runs, you get 100 results and you can and you have to do Jadzinski on this 100 work values. No, in this case, if you do 200 of the protein ligand and 400 of the ligand alone, 
you will get 200 times 400 work values that you can put inside Jadzinski average in order to get your free energy. And in this way, you of course reduce by a lot the probability of having a biased Jadzinski value. And you can always, if you know that it's biased, do few more runs and redo this post-processing of summing up the various work values again and you will get a huge amount of new work values by doing simply few extra actual molecular dynamic runs. In this way, Trzinski stops being this big problem where everything's biased and nothing wants to work or collaborate. And this process of summing together the work values is actually nothing more than convoluting the probability distributions of getting a certain work value for the bound process or for the unbound process. So if you remember how Crookes work it, where you got the, the probability distribution, by convolute, you are convoluting them together in order to get a better estimate of the probability distribution of the whole process, of the complete process. And that's a way in which you can use non-equilibrium chemical transformations to calculate the binding free energy of the protein ligand system. And this is the virtual double system single box method. As said, I left some interesting links in the description, so check them out. I hope you enjoyed the video. All the sources and the materials I used to do it are written in the description below. And here is some more content for you. But wait, don't click on it yet. First remember to leave a feedback in the comments section to let me know what you think about it. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, links in the description. And if you would like to support the channel, consider to donate on Patreon. Again, link in the description below. See you next time. I'm Maurice Karnbrook for The Computational Chemist.